Hi everyone, this is Ivo and today we're going to talk about Redis. It is one of the most exciting technologies in recent years when it comes to caching and it has taken the world by storm. If you are new to Redis, you are at the right place. In the following presentation, I'm going to give you an overview of how it works and a very high level uh, introduction to its different mechanics. If you're interested, you can always read the documentation. I hope you find the following presentation useful. Let's get started. In this talk, we're going to talk about Redis. What is it? Why should you care? And how it works? Let's start with a brief history. Redis stands for Remote Dictionary Server. It was created by Salvatore San Filippo in 2009. It was born out of the necessity to store viewership metrics for a few websites and display them in real time in a web page. It was originally written in a language called TCL, but after its success, it was rewritten in C, which is the current implementation. The earliest adopters were GitHub and Instagram. In 2011, Offer Bango created Redis Labs, which is the current lead sponsor company behind Redis. In 2015, Salvatore joined as an open source development lead. As of May 2020, it Redis is used by GitHub, Twitter, Stack Overflow, Flickr, and many others, with its adoption primarily driven by the ease of use and cloud providers. Now, let's compare Redis to a few other data store technologies so we can illustrate where Redis actually fits in terms of capabilities. So, in this table, despite non exhaustive, I have picked memcached as a comparison for in-memory data store, Postgres as an example of a relational database, and MongoDB as an example of NoSQL data store. Now, what I'm trying to illustrate with this table here is that Redis is significantly closer to a NoSQL database that is in-memory than just a simple key value cache that memcached is. Now, if we look at the storage operations we can uh, do, you have crude commands, bulk operations, partial transaction support. You also have master and follower replication, disk persistence, sharding, stored procedures, stuff that are usually associated with full on data stores such as Postgres or Oracle DB and so forth. Now, if we compare it plainly with memcached, because they're both in memory and having a comparison with on disk is a bit unfair, memcached is quite limited because it only offers key value mappings. It has a limit on the size of the keys you can do, while Redis offers you up to 15, uh, 512 megabyte sized keys, memcached can only do I believe 250 characters. Also, another notable difference is that Redis is single threaded while memcached is multi threaded. Why this matters, we will touch a little bit on when we go to the benchmarks. Now, I will not go through the other columns for the other two data stores, but uh, if you have a moment, just go over this table to kind of understand that. Redis is indeed closer to a full-on NoSQL database that just happens to be stored in memory instead of on disk than just a simple key value store. Now, what are the problems that Redis actually solves? The web is the primary use case and it, because it, it has to do with data storage regarding session, page views, analytics, location, and everything else. Now, because of the data and the scalability issues that web presents, this is what makes Redis very suitable for this type of problems. Now, let's think for an example of an online store when you add items to the basket. 
right? You need a lock for this item. So if you have an inventory of one, you don't have more than kind of one person being able to purchase it at a time. You would also like to potentially have rankings and leaderboards of the top purchased products. All of these limited uh, aggregation statistics such as min, max, median are provided and you can do them quite easily. You also have extreme performance because it's in memory. And if you want to store tracking analytics such as who has visited your page, which buttons they've clicked to kind of gather more insight into how people use your website, you can also store this in a very efficient manner. Now, what makes Redis amazing is that it's really, really fast. And the reason is, first of all, everything is in memory, okay? Because it's RAM, it's extremely fast because it's closer to the CPU and the faster your uh, RAM is, the better performance you're gonna get. The second one is because it's implemented in C. C is very close to the metal and the performance you can get from such a low level language is outstanding. Now, in this slide, I'm presenting a few benchmarks, but as anything related to benchmarks, please take them with a grain of salt. The reason is that the methodologies vary, hardware changes, software changes. So by the time you're watching this, it is entirely possible that there have been improvements and the metrics are now slightly out of date. Now, why I have them here is to just illustrate a point and start a slight comparison between Redis and Memcached. But before we do that, let's look into comparison with Redis and Postgres. So what we can see is that when it comes to get operations, Redis is 16 times faster. And when it comes to writing, it's 20 times faster, which is reasonable. Reason being is we're talking about in-memory operations instead of going to the disk. So it is as obviously unfair comparison of two data stores. Now, the more appropriate one, because of the way the data is stored, will be Redis and Memcached. So you would have 1 million gets and 1 million sets used as execution and measured as time. So Redis is slightly slower than memcached in both user time and system time. Now, there is a reason for this. As I mentioned, Redis is single-threaded while memcached is multi-threaded. But what we need to kind of focus on here is the following. In real-world performance, when these benchmarks are not run on local host and you have network latency uh, and all the other variables that are the real world, these tiny uh, slowdowns that we're talking about microseconds or even nanoseconds will probably get averaged out when we start talking about the number of clients that are connected and the number of instances we can run. Okay, so here Memcached has a slight advantage because it's multi-threaded and when we run on local host, it is somewhat intuitive to an extent. Again, it's very debatable, but one can make an argument. Now, this is why I have put this tiny chart on the right, which shows the requests per second across number of clients. As you can see, after 100 connected clients, the time gets amortized significantly and you reduce the deviation of operations. And this is important because in real life, you will not have a single Redis instance, you have multiple, you have replication, potentially sharding and everything else. So these tiny microseconds, again, they might change hardware changes, software changes, but the idea is that both in terms of performance are nearly identical while Redis is single thread. And finally, with a little bit outdated hardware, but we have a benchmark where it was run on Xeon E5520, where the test is how many set and get operations we can do per second and list push and list pop. Now the sets we can do uh, 552,000 per second, 707,000 for get, 767,000 for 
pushing to a list and for deleting from a list 770,000. Now, these metrics are again imperfect. And the reason is that they are using pipelining, which I will explain on what this is in just a moment. Data structures. Now, the data structures we can use in Redis is really rich. Now, everything in, is represented as a string. You have the classic string, which is any text, you have integers, 32 and 64 bits, and you have floats. Their implementation and standard compliance is the same as for the C language, since it's written in that one. List is a linked list of strings. The set is unique values uh, of a list. Hash is a hash map. Z set is a sorted set, which keeps your unique values sorted essentially all the time and it is excellent for keeping ranking for example in a game where you want to have the top scores always available all the time or any uh, time series data you work with because if you store the numbers as epoch millis you can always have the data sorted so it's a very very strong data structure that is very, very popular for all Redis users. Stream is an append-only log, similar to what Kafka has, uh, so that um, different consumers can consume one stream. Uh, this will actually make sense for the publish and subscribe model, which I'll cover in a second. Hyperlog log, it counts unique items in a space-efficient manner. It's kind of like a bloom filter. Bitmaps, as you can guess by the name, it's geared towards storing image data uh, and RGB kind of formatted uh, bytes. Uh, well, that's that's actually not correct. Uh, it it's geared towards storing images. Uh, geospatial indices. It encodes latitudes and longitude data. It is essentially a sorted set with geohash algorithm. This is the latest addition to the data structures. Now, there are some misconceptions I would like to clear. The first one is that you cannot nest these data structures in a sense that the most popular question is how do I nest hash map in a hash map? You really can't do this, although that's no longer true, and I'll explain why. So, the fact that you cannot nest a data structure such as hash map in a hash map, it is true. However, uh, there are workarounds. The first one is serializing and deserializing the data on client side while you store everything as, as a string. So for example, you have one hash map in Redis and the values inside are stringified hash maps. So when your client reads it, deserializes and you get your full data structure. It could be taxing depending on the language or the client you're working with. Another alternative is to store the separate keys, but you will need to redesign and come with some consistent naming to know which keys to index when so that you access the right hash map. And the third one is actually using a module to resolve this problem. And I will touch this near the end of the presentation. So there is an available workaround that is semi-official, let's call it that way. Now, publish and subscribe. Redis offers ability to publish events and for clients that have subscribed to these channels to listen. Now, it is not the killer feature of Redis, and this is very important. Uh, because it has at most once delivery guarantee. What this means is that once a message is published, there is nobody waiting for the client to acknowledge they've read the message. It's done. And this is very important because if we talk about financial data, let's say uh, transactions, you've purchased something, which is very important in order to kind of debit uh, your bank account and whatnot, if you miss this message, there is no replay. 
okay so if you're interested more into strong consistency Q functionality you should be looking towards Apache Kafka or RabbitMQ now the reason they've done this design choice is that if Redis has to wait for the client to acknowledge this a message it will build up a buffer really fast and actually throttle the performance because Redis is so fast and if you publish a lot of events really quickly let's say you have a short burst and until your clients catch up the Redis performance and all other operations will deteriorate so the choice makes a lot of sense however as I mentioned again it's not the strong part of Redis and it shouldn't be what you're using it for. The interface. So everything is commands. If you're familiar with Unix, you won't be surprised. So in here, I have a simple uh, setting and getting of a key. So you have set evil one, which essentially sets a key called evil with the value of one. In order to retrieve the value, you do get the key name. If you want to push to a list, you can do R push my key and then ABCD and pushes ABCD as the list values. And you can index this from the left by using L index and specifying a number or R index and to index from the right and so forth. So there are a lot of commands, we'll not go over them. It's not the purpose of this presentation. You can check them out on redis.io slash commands. You can also play in the sandbox available on try.redis.io, which is a kind of full-fledged Redis, and you can see if whatever use case you want to try Redis for would actually suit you by just playing it out in the sandbox. Transactions. All commands are atomic and the change is immediately visible to all clients. However, we need to make a strong differentiation between transactions in Redis and those in relational databases and other data stores. The important differences are they cannot be rolled back and there is an assumption of optimistic locking. Now, what transactions are is essentially a bulk execution of commands and that's what you should basically think about it and nothing else. Now, this is important and I want to kind of go back to the benchmarks again. The numbers you saw for the Xeon ones is they were using pipelining, which is the other name for transactions. So what this means is that you aggregate the collection of commands and you execute them at once. So, and the screenshot I have here you put all the commands you want to run between multi and exec and they will be executed as essentially one command. Now, what's the purpose of this? The main one is to remove race conditions and the second one is to reduce server and client round trips. So instead of having 10 commands, you go for each one back and forth, you do it only once. Now, the important part here is if you can actually afford this in the sense that if your client is happy to wait, let's say one second, so you aggregate all your updates in this one second and send them all together, or if you can't really allow to have one second delay, depending on your application, then you will have to do one by one. So it depends on your use case, but it's nice to know to have this available. Use pipelining whenever you can, simply because of the performance benefits. Now, client integrations, it's outstanding. In terms of language support, there are libraries for pretty much any language that is modern, actively used. I have worked with the libraries for C++, Python, and Node.js, and they're perfectly fine. They offer wrappers for some of the simple stuff, but they always, always also expose a low level a function where you can just write the Redis command and execute it. And this is how I usually use them because I wouldn't expect all these libraries to keep up perfectly with all the Redis innovations, new commands and implementations. So always going for low level libraries within those languages. 
Now, let's talk about data persistence and recovery. So there are two ways of storing data on disk. Both are compressible. The first one is a snapshot and the second one is an append-only file. Now, snapshot offers weak persistence and the way it works is it creates a fork of the current data and a copy to a file. Then you have, let's say, the follower copying that file over and this can happen in the background slightly slower, meaning Redis continues to work as it is, or you can do it in the foreground. Now, the metric I have here, which is 50 gigabytes being copied over in 20 minutes, or if it's background or in five minutes, if it's in foreground, is debatable because it will depend significantly on your hardware. In my experience, I've had dedicated hardware for Redis that does about 40 gigs in less than five minutes. And again, depends on the network latency, the memory you're using. It's highly debatable, so take these numbers with a grain of salt. Now, the append-only file offers strong persistency. What it does is it logs the file of changes and it minimizes data loss to sub-second and it's faster to persist on disk. However, the downside is that if you need to restart, it's very slow to spin up because it has to replay the entire log file in order to restore the data to where you are. In either case, whichever one you choose, if Redis runs out of memory, it will start using swap and performance will degrade significantly. That's very important to know. Now, be conscious of what data you put in Redis and what cluster size you're operating with so that you never end up in a situation where Redis has to start using swap. Replication. There is, no, there is only a single master doing writes and propagates changes to followers. There is no master-master replication. The replication process is quite straightforward. What happens is the master starts a background snapshot and it starts holding a log of all writes since that snapshot and the follower afterwards get wiped out and starts syncing to the snapshot. After it synced up, the follower gets start syncing to the writes backlog that the master has been keeping since the snapshot and that's how they end up even and up to date. Now, this is quite straightforward. This is the essentials when it comes to replications and how follower always have up-to-date data. Now, with that note, I want to touch on one of the new features that Redis has added, which is diskless replication. And what diskless replication is the following. Now, right now, when you resync, what happens is you have a snapshot file written to disk, and it's then fetched from that disk to the replica, which is really slow because it goes to disk. Diskless replication is essentially streaming that file over the wire from the master directly to the replica, entirely skipping the disk part, which if you stay only in memory, can guess that it increases performance significantly. So this is one of the latest additions, which is significant speed up when it comes to replication. A few extra notes on the replication side, it has to do with how you structure your cluster. So since you have a single master, here we have a lot of followers. But if your master has to constantly create snapshots and keep syncing with followers, what you will end up with is bottlenecking your master and deteriorating its performance. So it sometimes makes sense to have sub followers which are actually replicating a follower. This way, your master can actually reduce the number of snapshots it has to make and still have consistent data. Now, I haven't done this personally, but my advice is if you end up in such a situation where you have that many replicas, it's more of a symptom that you're doing something wrong. So I would advise you to kind of reevaluate design and topology and uh, maybe look into sharding or kind of restructure your data. Because if you have one master and way too many replicas, even if you have a high read to write percentage, it is not an excellent 
place to be in because of again this snapshotting and having to keep so many replicas in sync which exposes you to race conditions and so forth next we are going to touch on the sentinel so this is also relatively new addition to redis it allows for redis to be a full-fledged distributed system with all the expectations one would have around monitoring, notification, automatic failover. Now, it gives you all of these goodies relatively easy, but there is one consideration to have when you set it up. Always have multiple Sentinels on your Redis nodes. The reason is, since your Sentinel is now your entry point to your Redis cluster, if you have only one, you have a single point of failure. If you have multiple, they can talk between each other and have consensus when they need to have changes. So an example will be you will get, uh, let's say, less false positives if one Sentinel cannot access a Redis node. Instead of marking it immediately, oh, this node is down, I have to re-elect a master or something along these lines. If it's just a temporary network issue, while the other two sentinels are perfectly connected fine, you not actually have to re-elect master and you can continue operating. So this is the benefit of having multiple sentinels being operational. Also, even if one sentinel goes down, you still have other two as backup to go and you are not exposed to a single point of failure. Sharding. Now, Redis cluster offers automatic sharding across nodes. Uh, the idea behind it is to improve cluster resiliency in case of node failure. Now, the idea is that you need to find the perfect number of shards because if you have way too many, you basically create a problem which is you need to touch way too many nodes to aggregate data from. If you have way too few, you might create a hotspot where only one node is heavily hit and other two, for example, are idle. So the key to sharding is striking a balance and Redis essentially the way it assigns is by using CRC 16 of the key you've passed, module 16384. This is how it assigns the partition to which to actually put the key in. Now, this is just a high level overview of sharding. If you're very interested in it, strongly advise you to read the official documentation on it. Client side caching. Now, everything we've talked about up to this point is about value stored on the server. Now, what about if we can get these values on client and never have to go to the server? So one idea is having client side caching. And let me explain how it works. So the idea is that the server will keep a map of all keys that are stored on individual clients. So when there is a value modified on the server, it will send an invalidation message to the client along with the new value. So you will have your clients having an up-to-date copy of your server data. This, however, has to be kept on server, which increases the demand for memory. So you can improve performance by reducing latency, reducing round trips between server and client, and can do with fewer Redis nodes if you provide more space to your server to actually keep this extra map. Now, it is actually a bit more complicated when it comes to the invalidation because it has a caching slot in order to not have way too many nodes and not too frequent invalidation messages. It's a really, really interesting topic. I strongly advise you again, read the official documentation if you find this exciting. Pluggable module system. It was created because of constant scope creep. Originally, Redis was extensible via Lua scripting since ver version 2.6, but since it was rewritten in C, an SDK is now provided where people can write their own plugins. On this slide, I have a selection of the most popular one, such as Neural Redis, which is trainable neural networks as a native data type, 
Redis search is a full text search over Redis, Redis SQL, full SQL capabilities embedding SQLite. Redis JSON offers JSON as a native data type which is the solution to the nested structures we mentioned earlier and it is perfectly fine. I have used it myself and I have no complaints. It works as expected, stores the data correctly. I can recommend it. What's next? Now, version 6 is already out. It even has a few revisions. But what does it actually bring? First of all, SSL no channels, HTTPS everywhere, encryption everywhere, followed by access control list, which allows you to define users and what commands they can run, and you have more control over what's happening on the cluster. New APIs for the module system, client-side caching, which is what we discovered, uh, what we discussed just a second ago, along with a new RESP3 protocol, which has better replies. Also, diskless replication and better thread performance, which is up to two times better uh, when it comes to pipelining, when it cannot be used. The sources for these presentations were primarily the official Redis documentation, uh, the Redis in Action book, and a few videos uh, on YouTube. Now, if you found this presentation interesting and you want to explore the topics further, definitely go to the official documentation. It's really well written. It's really well explained. It is available on GitHub. Just definitely this is the one true source you should refer to. And finishing with this meme, I want to thank you for listening and joining me for this nice presentation and giving you an overview of what Redis is and how it works and why you should care. So, this is it. Thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed it, give it a thumbs up. If you've loved it, subscribe. Any comments or suggestions for following videos are welcome in the comment section. That's it. I'll see you next time.